Welcome, everybody. I see. I know there's lots of familiar faces out there and some new ones. Um, I'm Catherine Zakelli Sullivan, and I am in my second year as the Ceiling Sale Coordinator with the Worcester County Conservation District. And um, each year we have a theme for our sale. And this year, the theme I chose was promoting native plants in uh, for our yards, gardens, farms, and neighborhoods. Um, and as part of our sale, even though it's a fundraiser, um, we want to make sure that we have an educational component because that's part of our district um, mission. So this webinar on installing rain gardens is part of a series of four webinars we'll be having. Um, other upcoming webinars are on lawns and lawn alternatives, um, native plants and birds, what's the connection, um, and the Third, the fourth one is going to be um, forest soils, an introduction to forest soils and using for soil mapping tools online and um, tips for successful tree planting. So those are coming up and those are on our website if you wanna learn more about them. So um, today's webinar is gonna be hosted by uh, two members of the Worcester County Conservation District. We have Ed Himlin here who's part of the Massachusetts Watershed Coalition. And he has been on the Worcester County Board of Supervisors for, I think we said four decades, Ed. Congratulations. 40 years. Yeah, 40 years, which has been a great, yeah. great service to us. And in addition, we have Joel Betts, who will be speaking today. And Joel is a newly hired employee who's been with us for a year been a full year and Joel has experience um, in his work back in Michigan where he went to school um, he did some work installing rain gardens and planting rain gardens so we have someone who's new to our board and someone who is a veteran and we're happy to have both of them joining us today um, before I give the webinar off to them um, just to let you know, I'll be in the background, I'll be muted, but I'll answer chat questions as I can, or we'll bring them to Joel and Ed at different breaks. Um, and if you have a question, you can raise your hand on the buttons below. Um, we're gonna have a couple polls as we go. Appreciate anyone who wants to answer those. Um, and I also want to mention that we do have a few other board members who are joining us today so that you can start to learn about who we are. Uh, we have Lisa Trotto, who is our district administrator. We have Joe Smith, who is a, on our board of supervisors. We have Sue Finney, and we also welcome Jenny Simpson, who's our newest board supervisor. So with that, send me questions in the chat and I will send it over to you guys. Thank you so much. All right, go ahead, Ed. I think you've got control of the screen here. Oh, okay, good. I'm just going to uh, take the poll off for me. I'll end it here. We can share the results. Cool. All right, so we've got 64% um, interested but not decided in putting in a rain garden. 23%, five people who are going to put one in. Great. Well, hopefully this is a helpful talk for you all. Well, I hope everybody enjoys it. And good afternoon. I'm Ed Himlin. Um, thank you for the good introduction, Catherine. And I'm pleased to talk about rain gardens. Um, they're just a, a simple, fun way to enrich the yard and help keep water clean. The um, Environmental Protection Agency and the State Department of Environmental Protection um, both agree that it's stormwater that comes from buildings and yards and parking and so forth. It's the biggest threat that we have to all the waters in the state. And I can say that, um, you know, many, many streams and many, many lakes across the state are being severely hurt by dirty runoff. But most of those problems can be uh, fixed pretty easily by putting stormwater in the ground. And I think this is all part of thinking green to make our yards and our neighborhoods more environmentally friendly. Um, 
And what rain gardens can do is they can filter pollutants. And by doing that, you can also heal uh, streams that have been damaged. So my slideshow is gonna start with a brief introduction to watersheds. Um, I think we all know about watersheds, but we don't think about them very often. And then I'm gonna to touch upon some of the damages caused by stormwater. And um, then talk a little bit about solutions like rain gardens and take a few minutes to explain how you can build a rain garden in your yard or for your business. Then Joe will continue on with more information about soils and plants and how to maintain a beautiful rain garden for your home or for your business. I don't have control. I think you do now. Try to just click your, your arrow on your keyboard. There you go. All right, good. So you can go forward. We're going to go back. Great. So this is what we have um, for most towns in Worcester County. Uh, this is a, a diagram of a watershed. And you can see the rain coming down from the clouds and the little brooks coming together, forming streams. And then they um, go into rivers like the Blackstone River. And some of the rivers and streams are um, impounded to create lakes, uh, like Lake Consigamon down in Worcester, and many, many lakes. There's hundreds of lakes all across Worcester County. And for the most part, um, in Worcester County, uh, much of the county is in this natural condition, forested condition. Um, and for that forested condition, you end up with a typical water budget for the year where two thirds of the rain and snow that come down is going back into the ground. Some of it, about a third is going back into the uh, atmosphere, but you only get a very, very small amount, less than 3%, I mean, less than 1% of water running off into the streams and into the ponds. But then as uh, we do more building in the watershed, homes, businesses, streets, uh, and so forth, that this changes. And what you end up with uh, is developed conditions and big change in terms of the annual water budget. So now you're seeing that um, less than half of the water is going into the ground and you're getting a tremendous amount of uh, uh, runoff, about a hundred fold increase in the amount of survey weather reports. That's why we have a lot of, you know, reason why we have less water in the ground uh, during dry times like we had last summer and fall. Um, and so all the streams and ponds were getting very low. Um, and the uh, stormwater situation is a big thing that causes that. And the bigger thing is that um, there's a lot of pollutants in uh, road runoff. And you can kind of get the picture of that. With this next slide, this is what happens during storms. Um, sorry, my computer isn't doing what it should. It's not doing what I want it to do. So anyway, so this is what happens in the in the storm. Um, all of the uh, houses, the water is running off of the roofs onto the driveways and then down into the street. And then it comes down the street and it suddenly disappears and it goes into a catch basin. But then that catch basin usually dumps into a little tiny brook that's really alive with different kinds of stream life. Um, and all of that is collected, so we're getting tons and tons of stormwater uh, and dirty runoff going into a lot of the little brooks and ponds. And this is a great slide from the Mass Department of Environmental Protection. So if you're washing your car in your driveway, 
or on the street, you're really only minutes away from uh, a stream because of the drainage system and you're essentially uh, putting that soapy water right into the local lake or the local stream. And so there's a lot of harmful stuff in runoff and uh, I'm just going to quickly run through some of the things that you'll find that run in stormwater runoff. And these are some of the pollutants. And the one that is, of, uh, in my mind, the biggest problem is just dirt. Uh, a lot of dirt uh, is going in. And I'd say in communities, you may have um, anywhere from uh, 10,000 tons to uh, 100,000 tons going into the streams every year. Along with dirt, you're getting a lot of um, leaves and other organic matter. And you can see that particularly in the fall, if you see catch basins, you'll see that there's always a lot of leaves over it. And uh, when those leaves get into the stream along with the dirt, then they take the oxygen out of it. Then another big source of pollutants is uh, poisons, the various chemicals that are put down uh, including pesticides, uh, a lot of pesticides used in the yard. Um, you also have the problem with uh, cars and petroleum products and the metals that are coming off of the cars uh, and the rubber and all of that is going into the streams. You also have uh, debris, uh, a lot of plastics uh, and well, a lot of that plastic ends up going through the streams and then eventually ending up in the ocean. And I think we're all very much aware of what's been happening in terms of plastics in the ocean. Another problem that uh, is in stormwater is that people often fertilize uh, more than they need to. Um, and they fertilize at a time when they shouldn't. <laughs> so you end up a lot of that fertilizer being which is water soluble, end up going into the streams. And once it gets into the streams, it ends up causing a lot of um, growth of plants and algae and so forth. So that's another source of nutrients. I mean, another source of the problem. And then um, another main source of um, pollutants in a stream is just bacteria and a bunch of different sources for that. And I think one of the most common ones is dogs. Uh, and people, I think, have gotten really good about picking up after their dogs. There's been a lot of publicity on that. But I still see in my neighborhood, I still see dogs roaming free and they're not picking up after themselves. So dogs are, uh, you know, a big source of um, pollutants into ponds and into streams. And then the last thing, which people generally don't think about, is uh, thermal stress. And this is particularly during the summer uh, when you, all the roads, the dark pavement gets heated up and uh, the runoff then goes into the catch basin and it goes directly into the stream. And the stream critters are not uh, adapted to those kinds of warm temperatures. So those have a big impact on all of the life in the streams and the ponds. And the end result is that wild brook trout are disappearing. Um, and particularly in the eastern part of uh, Massachusetts, if you go east of 495, there aren't very many um, wild brook trout left anymore. Um, West of 495, there are, I fish for trout, so I find particular concern for this. And you may also ask, you know, why are trout important? And my answer is, is that the trout, uh, which are very sensitive to the pollutants in stormwater, um, they're sort of the canaries in the coal mine. So when they start disappearing, which is happening, as I said, in the eastern third of the state, they're gone then they're a sign that um, there's problems for people. Uh, it's a sign that stormwater pollution poses a, health, a risk for our children, uh, kids who are playing in the brooks or our dogs who may be going in the brooks. 
Um, it's also a problem for our drinking water supplies, and that's a big problem, getting bigger every year for our use of lakes and ponds. Um, and I think people have probably seen in the news more and more frequently that uh, different lakes, different ponds that have to be closed for the end of summer because of uh, toxic algae blooms uh, and cyanobacteria. And I'll leave it at that. I won't spend, that's a big subject. But what we're finding is more and more research is showing that uh, stormwater can hurt people along with wildlife and fish. So that's the bad news. And this is the good news. Um, Stormwater pollution is uh, more or less inexpensive to fix and uh, particularly inexpensive to prevent to begin with. And the main idea here is just, just to put the water back in the ground. And some simple things that can be done include keeping trees, putting in rain gardens, and you'll see a picture of a rain garden here, uh, and using narrower streets. A lot of our streets are very wide. Uh, and they produce a lot of stormwater. And then using open drainage, which used to be uh, a common thing that most towns use. They didn't have uh, storm drainage systems. They just leave a, a channel along the side of the road. But all of that would then put the stormwater back into the ground where it could be filtered and infiltrated into the soil um, and eliminate all of the pollutants that were in it. And that's essentially what we want to do in terms of homes um, is to mimic uh, that and put the rain back into the ground because that's where it belongs. And these are just a few simple things that can be done around the home, uh, putting uh, trees and shrubs. Uh, you can use porous paving for driveways and walkways. Uh, if you see, uh, on the bottom there, you can use ground covers along the edge of the property so that the water will go into the ground cover and it won't make it to the street. And then of course there's rain gardens and that's uh, what I'm gonna go on to at this point. And this is just a way of reconnecting with the rain. Um, and the next few slides, uh, I'm just gonna go um, quickly over you know, how do you build rain gardens? And then we'll talk about what goes in them. So this is uh, a slide showing what another reason for growing rain gardens is to have uh, attraction for uh, different kinds of insects and pollinators. Uh, and what you see here, of course, is a hummingbird moth and those two on the left and then a hummingbird on the right. And um, one of the nice things what I just found out about hummingbirds is that I never knew is that hummingbirds eat mosquitoes and they eat a lot of mosquitoes. So it's nice to have hummingbirds around the house. The, um, I also like butterflies. We get lots of different kinds of butterflies. This is just a few that I've I found in my yard, uh, usually we get 20 or 30 different kinds. And they're just all part of the food web between birds, fish, wildlife, and us. And then other um, things you'll find with rain gardens and the kinds of insects it brings in. And these are uh, dragonflies. The one on the left there is a white, uh, common white tail. And then there's a yellow leg battle hawk, which is the red one. And then on the bottom is a uh, dog day harvest bug or a cicada. And actually we're gonna be seeing a lot more cicadas in the coming months. So those are just a few of those things that are um, we find in terms of uh, what gets attracted to a rain garden and how we can support more diversity in our yard and enrich our yard uh, with a rain garden that brings in different pollinators and insects. Hey, Ed, before you go on, yeah. me, can you tell us what any of those plants were that were on those past couple slides? Do you know? Plants, the plants. or bugs? The plants. Probably getting into um, that as well. Yeah, the one, the one that the cicada is on mm -hmm. is a um, aster. 
and I'm trying to remember the name, Stokes Astor. Okay. And that was the picture I took. I'm guessing, but I don't know what's on the red dragonfly is on. I'm going to guess maybe an oak leaf, but I'm not sure. Okay. And um, on the bottom slide, uh, the tiger swallowtail is on echinacea, mm -hmm. coneflower. And I don't know what that um, black swallowtail above it is on. And I'm unsure of what the monarch is on. Okay, thank you. So those are the, that's the first time I've been asked that question. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. I'll be highlighting some other plants soon here too. Yeah, yeah. Joel, Joel's going to talk all about different kinds of plants and the ones that we have at the seedling sale. So the first thing to do if you're thinking about building a rain garden is to go out when it's raining and see if the, where the rain's going and if it's staying on the property, which for a lot of people it does, you know, a lot of yards doesn't leave the property, doesn't go out on the street. Then uh, it's still great to build a garden, but you don't need to do a rain garden. Uh, but if it is going out to the street and you want to capture it and keep it uh, from harming the stream and pond nearby, um, you want to make the garden uh, in terms of size would be about a quarter is the rule of thumb or a third of the impervious area. So if you had an 800 square foot roof or an 800 square foot driveway, basically you'd want to have a rain garden that was 10 feet wide by 20 feet long, um, and it can be any shape, but you essentially want a 200 square foot rain garden. And then as far as selecting the location for the rain garden, you want to, uh, you don't want to build it into a place um, where the rain is not draining well. So if you've got places on the yard that are puddling, it's a sign that there um, is not good drainage there. So you wouldn't want to put a rain garden there because it's just going to be a problem. It's not going to work right. And the other thing you want to do is when you plan to put a rain garden in, you want to keep it 10 feet away from the house foundation because the water that you put into the rain garden is going to soak into the ground and it's going to have a raise the groundwater level up slightly. But that could come back and cause you problems in your cellar. So uh, you want to keep it at least 10 feet away from a foundation and you want to keep it uh, at least 10 feet away from a septic leach field. So those are some of the simple rules. I generally, you know, you have to also consider, and I don't have it on here, uh, what do you have already? And, um, you know, if you have trees, you probably don't want to be putting it right under a tree because you're going to end up damaging the roots and so forth. So, uh, but these are just some basic rules of thumb. And then as far as building the rain garden, once you have figured out a place where you want to put it, the very first thing you want to do before you take a shovel and start digging up the ground is to call uh, dig safe, which is 811. And um, they will tell you if there are any uh, utility lines, electric, gas, so forth, uh, so that you're not causing problems for yourself. You start digging. Uh, the rain garden, and that's just a general thing. If you're ever going to be digging in the yard, you, you want to give dig safe a call first. But once you do that, thanks, Catherine. Uh, once you do that, then all you need to do is dig, you know, dig down a shallow basin, uh, maybe 12 to 18 inches deep, and then take the soil that you pull out of that, and you want to mix it to create a bio soil mix. Um, and the general recommendation for that is that it needs to be 50% sand, 30% compost, and 20% topsoil. And what that will give you is a very loose, friable soil that will really promote all of the growth of the plants, uh, allow the roots to grow quickly. And that same mixture will do a very good job in terms of filtering and cleansing any runoff that's coming into the rain garden. And then as far as plants go, my general recommendation is that you want to have um, one plant for every two to four square feet of rain garden. 
So I mentioned before a 200 square foot rain garden, um, you would need anywhere between 50 and 100 plants to go in there, perennials, shrubs, so forth. But you want to consider the size of the plant. Uh, so of course, if you're putting in larger plants, you need fewer. And if you're putting in smaller plants, you need more. And one of the things, and Joel will talk more about this, um, is that in terms of the plants, you want to put the plants that like wet feet in the deepest part of the garden because that soil is going to be the wettest. The other soil on the edges of the garden is going to be drier. And what you'll find is that um, the plants will grow and actually they grow pretty rapidly. Um, and so um, you're going to need to thin them out. Uh, in some cases, you're going to need to move them around uh, because they may not do as well as you'd like in the first place you put them. And in some cases, they're not going to do well at all. So you may need to replace them, but that's very rare. I, I, we've had, um, you put in many, many rain gardens. And they've been around for 10, 15 years now. And uh, usually the, the plants are pretty hardy. And they come back year after year. And this is just a, um, profile, a side view of what a rain garden is, just to give you another view. So what I said before is you want to have a uh, basin that's basically six to 18 inches deep. You want to have a soil mix of 50% sand, 30% organic uh, compost, and 20% topsoil. Then you put your uh, perennials and the shrubs in that. And the last thing you do is to put a, a covering of mulch. And the purpose of the mulch is really threefold. One is it's gonna make the job of uh, weeding the rain garden a lot easier. You won't get as many weeds growing in that. Two is that during the drier times, like last uh, this past summer and early fall, uh, it's gonna keep the soil more moist. You won't have to water it. And then the third thing is that the mulch, and this is good for any garden, not just rain gardens, but the mulch will keep the soil warmer. And plants actually continue growing throughout the year. They don't stop growing in, in winter, they slow up. But by keeping the soil warmer, the plants will be able to start growing earlier and to be able to continue growing later. And this particular diagram uh, you see on the bottom there, number four, shows an under drain, but uh, that's very uncommon. Uh, you generally won't need a, an under drain. We've, I've helped to build more than 100 rain gardens and we've only put one in one time and that was because we didn't put it in the right place to begin with. So those are just a few simple things you need to do in terms of the rain garden. And then what to plant, um, Joel's gonna go on and talk more about this, but basically, uh, Native plants are really the preferred you know, because they're the best adapted to the climate around here. Um, you want to put in berry and nectar producers, uh, so you're creating food for the wildlife, and make a combination of things that you like, uh, so that you can have uh, different plants growing all year long. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joel. Thanks. I'm going to stop control here. All right. Well, thanks, Ed. And yeah, it's a great segue into what I want to talk about, which is a little bit more about plant selection um, and then about how to maintain your rain garden. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I, I worked in rain garden maintenance and installation um, right out of undergrad now, four or five years ago, and I'm excited to be um, able to offer that a bit here too. So let's see if I can move forward on the slide. So I'm going to run through a few of the different um, things to consider when selecting native plants for your garden. And um, one of the first things that you want to consider uh, is what the benefits to wildlife might be that you're going for. So as Ed mentioned, you know, you, uh, one great thing about rain gardens is you can plant native plants that host pollinators. Um, and it's not just as a food source, although it is, um, a lot of plants also are the host plant for different pollinator species. On the, on the right here, you can see um, some insect eggs on this blade of grass, um, probably a native grass here. Um, so, you know, it's not just the food source and the flowers, but it's also the plant itself. Um, and that's true for birds as well. So 
a lot of birds use shrubs and grasses and um, perennials for either you know materials for their nests or um, as nesting habitat. So having these features in your yard is really important. And um, that's also for food and that's year round. You know, a lot of these, these shrubs and, and plants have seeds and berries throughout the winter, even if they don't look very tasty They're you know, those dried up fermented berries are, are great overwintering food sources for birds. Um, and then, you know, some small mammals, some of our native, uh, native mammals might appreciate those habitats as well. Um, and the key to wildlife benefits is diversity. So you can see here a couple of the different plants that we sell from that we're selling in our seedling sale. Um, I'll go through a couple of these. So on the top right, we've got Golden Alexander um, is actually a host plant for this um, this kind of bee, which is which is um, there's a couple of names for it. I've heard Zizia bee, which is the genus for for Golden Alexander. That's actually a uh, only its main source is, is this kind of plant. Um, it's, it's a specialized bee for golden alexanders. So it's great to be able to provide that in your garden. These black swallowtails um, also will lay their eggs on golden alexanders. Um, so that's a great plant to plant. Uh, you can, uh, the button bush here is a host plant for sphinx moths. Um, that's another one we're selling. Um, and as many people know, the milkweeds are host plants for monarchs. Um, they lay their eggs there. They use it as nectar. The, the caterpillars eat the leaves. Um, this is a swamp milkweed. We're actually selling two versions of milkweed. We've got butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed. Um, and on the left here, a great source. Um, cardinal flower is a great source for hummingbirds, for nectar. Um, it's actually adapted to that. You can see the, little, the long um, features there that, that accommodate the hummingbird's beak. Um, winterberry in the middle here is a great winter food source uh, for birds like cedar waxwings that are migrating south. Um, here we've got a mantis uh, egg ca uh, capsule um, that's on a native plant. Um, so that's and then and then up here we've got dog dogwood is a great shrub for lots of our uh, birds to build their nests in. And as part of this, you want to also consider bloom period to maximize your native plant. Uh, benefit, um, you want to try to have things blooming year round so that pollinators have a consistent food supply. So, you know, here's a few of the ones that we're selling in our sale. We've got Eastern Redbud, which blooms from March to May, Golden Alexander from May to June, Butterfly Milkweed from June to August, and New England Aster from August to October. So, you know, if I was designing a rain garden, I would try to incorporate these four plants, for example, um, in order to maximize bloom period and have multiple things blooming all throughout the year. Um, that's really great for pollinators and most bee producers would know that as well but um, you know we're also considering our native bees and our native pollinators. Then another thing to consider is plant morphology and I like to think of this in terms of the benefits it provides for stormwater retention which is our main goal of our rain garden. Um, so different root types you know allow for different kinds of drainage. Tap roots like this on the right here would create um, a deep and large pore for drainage. So it might be beneficial to have one of those or a few of those plants that have tap roots um, towards the base. So you have these really nice drainage areas. Uh, people actually, producers actually grow radishes for that purpose because they help um, break up the soil and create pores for water to drain. Um, and then fibrous root plants like some of our grasses and our perennials like this are also really great because they help absorb stormwater and help the, help the soil maintain um, moisture and stormwater throughout the season. Um, and, you know, they also help treat even more stormwater. So, you know, they're absorbing a lot of water. These plants often have a high water demand. And then another thing to consider is if you're doing a long-lived perennial plant versus a short-lived, some of our plants like cardinal flower only live a few years, so they don't develop that deep of a root system, whereas some of our sedges and grasses and asters could live for decades and therefore their root system might be huge. Um, and you know, they might have a better benefit for, for um, stormwater. Um, and then you know, in general, it's good to have as much diversity as possible in terms of your above ground growth, but also your below ground growth. Um, you wanna maximize the amount of roots and, and um, pores that are happening in the soil to, in order to maximize drainage and, and water treatment. And that also helps improve the health of the soil. Um, and healthy soils will process more stormwater, process more pollutants, because it's those microbes that are associated with the roots that do that. So in general, in a rain garden, diversity is key. And you can see that here in this picture from earlier. We've got shrubs, perennials, grasses, um, and those, you know, as diverse as that looks above the ground, it's the same below the ground. We've got a lot of different kinds of root systems. 
And you can see that in this picture as well. Um, these are a bunch of different perennial prairie plants, some of which are planted in rain gardens. You see purple coneflower here. They have very different root systems, right? Um, and on the left here, we've got long grass. You can see, you know, its roots only go a couple inches down, and that's much less um, has much less capability of treating stormwater and um, draining water than these other perennial plants do. So that's just something to consider, and why, and, you know, that's why a rain garden is better than just a low spot in your lawn. Another thing to consider is the shade or sun preference. Um, I know on our seedling sale we have all these we have this listed for all of our plants. Um, but it's really important in terms of, you know, the success of your plant selection. So, um, you know, Canada wild ginger, for example, is found in forest understories. So it's a shade plant. Whereas golden Alexander is more flexible. It can be in partial to full sun, part, part shade. Um, if you're going to plant butterfly milkweed, that's found in our driest habitats here in Massachusetts. So, you know, that's a full sun plant. So you want to make sure you're planting a plant in a way that it's going to succeed. And these are all ones that we're selling in our seedling sale as well. Everything that I'm highlighting here are, are available to purchase. And then the other thing to consider um, is what the flood or drought, drought tolerance is. And this has to do with the, the natural conditions the plant grows in. So um, you can see I really like this scale. Um, and I've actually developed um, a spreadsheet that will make this available for any uh, anyone who's interested um, for the plants that we're selling. Um, there's a scale of wetland to upland plants, um, whereas, you know, as plant is assigned a value, negative five is um, obligate wetland plant. So it occurs almost always in wetlands under natural conditions. It won't grow well where there's not standing water or at least really saturated soils. And then the whole range up to upland plants where it almost never occurs in wetlands under natural conditions. And, and if you had any standing water or saturated soils, it would likely die out. And then, so for, for rain gardens, I like to focus on these, um, these middle categories where they maybe usually occur in wetlands, but can be found in non-wetlands. Maybe there's some flexibility there. Uh, so you might plant that towards the base, towards the lowest part of your rain garden, but it could handle a dry period. Um, or something that occasionally occurs in wetlands, maybe can handle the flooding of the rain event, but usually would be in non-wetlands. I would plant that towards the, the upper side of the rain garden. Um, and then, you know, you can plant these upland and wetland plants, but I would have, uh, you know, the upland plants on the far edge of the rain garden where it's not going to get a lot of flooding, and the wetland plants only in the lowest part of the rain garden, and then in dry spells, you'd have to water them. So an example of the, a few examples of this from our seedling sale. We're selling marsh marigolds and cardinal flowers, which are obligate wetland species. So if you decide to put these in your yard, you want to make sure to keep them in a low spot that generally has saturated soils or even standing water. Um, and in dry periods, you could get a lot of water on those things. Um, blue vervain is a great plant that we have um, that is facultative wetlands. So that means it can handle not being wet all the time, but it prefers to be wet. Golden Alexander is a really flexible plant, can handle being wet or not. Um, Eastern Redbud prefers to be in the upland, but can handle some wet sometimes, whereas Butterfly Milkweed uh, can't be in standing water. It will, it will probably die. It's more of a sandy soil upland plant. Um, so that's just really important to consider when you're planting your rain garden. Um, and you know, as an example of this, I want to run through how I would design a rain garden based on some of these considerations. Um, so this is. Um, from another Michigan website, because uh, that's where my experience is. But this is an example rain garden. Um, I'll, uh, I'll run through it here. So we've got a gradient of shade to sun. So this part of the rain garden is shaded. This part of the rain garden is sunny. There might be kind of part shade here. Um, we've got our drain here. Let's say a downspout is draining to this area. And then this is the excavated area that where it's all low here. This is upper upland area. You can kind of see it in the last slide um, where these are kind of elevated around the edges. This is a low area. This is where the drain is. Let's say the house is over here and they, they undergrounded their, their um, pipeline from their roof to the, from their gutters to the spot to drain into this low area here, for example. Um, so when I consider, when I see this, you know, I think, well, let's get some dry upland plants in this area. Um, that can handle a lot of sun. Let's get some upland plants over here because this is an elevated area, um, but that are, you know, that can handle shade. Uh, and then in here, we'll put our wetland plants and this will be our lowest wettest spot. So maybe we can actually put a real wetland plant there like swamp milkweed. Um, and so, you know, 
I've put here um, the shade tolerant shrub that can handle wet, but can also handle some dry. Um, here we've got wild ginger because that's the shadiest part. That's a shade plant. Um, Eastern redbud uh, is a shade plant as well towards this side of the garden. Um, and can, but it's further up, so you know you're not going to get quite as much saturated soil there from that drain. Um, and then here we've got blue vervain and swamp milkweed, which are both wetland plants in this lowest part of the part of there. And they're both, um, you know, you've got part sun because this is the shadier side. You've got full sun here, swamp milkweed. Um, and then, you know, on this upper side of the garden, the driest part, I put butterfly milkweed because that's a dry plant. Um, Golden Alexanders can handle a variety of conditions, so I put that there. And New England Aster, which is facultative wet, but actually can handle pretty dry soils. Um, they're a pretty flexible plant. Um, I put it towards the wetter area, but still in the upland part. But all those are full sun. Um, and you can see the bloom times on these. I, just, I picked plants that would have, um, you know, the whole variety of months covered. So we've got stuff blooming as early as March here and April. May, June, June to August, August to October. So the idea is to have things blooming throughout the whole year. Um, so that's the kind of considerations you make when you're doing a garden plan. Um, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions about that or help people make plans for their own for their own gardens. And then the last focus of this talk, I wanted to talk about um, rain garden maintenance because a lot of people think, well, we're using native plants, so you know why uh, like the, the benefit of that is that they're native, they don't need anything. Well, that may be true at, once it's really well established, but in reality, to have a really well functioning rain garden, you have to pay some attention to it, especially in the first few years to help it get established. Um, because better establishment means less future maintenance, means better habitat for birds and pollinators. Um, it keeps gardens efficient at treating stormwater and it can improve the aesthetic depending on what aesthetic you're going for. Um, if you want a really organized garden look, that might not, not actually be, that can compete with rain garden function as well, because the goal here, um, this is an example of one that we installed when I was working in Michigan. The goal here is to go from something that's like this, um, sparse. Oh, we got the, the poll starting here. Catherine, did you want to pause and make that poll happen? So, um, the goal here is that ideally after a few years, you would have one that's really filled out um, and, you know, has uh, really, really uh, developed good root systems, flowering plants, um, and, you know, has a lot of capacity to handle stormwater. Um, this garden, this new garden, will handle some stormwater, but not near as much because these plants aren't very well um, very well developed. So some people say this looks nicer than that, but in terms of function, this is what we're going for. Excuse me, Joel. Yep. A couple questions here, and I'm sorry I interrupted you by posting that poll and That's then right. not be able to unmute myself. Um, oh, okay. There's a question here about, um, the question is, what about structures for allowing water to drain in and also, do you want an outflow for water to drain out? And either you or Ed can answer that question. So usually when we've installed them, it depends on what you're going for. This is a curb cut rain garden. So the structure here is you know, that you excavate the ground below the road and then the water actually drains. The curb is not cut here, but you can see it has been cut there. It actually drains down in there. So we installed structures to slow that down, you know, these rocks before it hits the plants, and then the plants help absorb the rainwater in this low area over here. Um, and, you know, other structures, I guess, um, I, I would say it's more by shaping the land and forming a sort of basin um, and making sure that it's decently well-drained soil so that it doesn't pond. Um, it, you know, some people will install, uh, they'll have their gutter pipe underground to the rain garden, and then, you know, that will uh, allow the water to go to the place they want it to in order to drain. Um, and you know, if if your soils are not very well drained, or if there is only you know two or three feet to an impermeable layer, then you might want to install some sort of drain. Or if you don't want it to overflow and you get a lot of runoff and it's not big enough to handle all of that runoff, some people put a drain to the street 
in the middle of it that's elevated by a couple of feet so that if it starts to flood or starts to get high uh, in, you know, if that basin starts to get high in a, in a rain event, it will drain after a certain amount. But then that defeats the purpose, you know, so you want to capture as much water as you can before draining it to the street or something like that. Thank Any you other? very much. I, I'll, I'll address a little bit more of that, so maybe I'll keep going. Unless you wanted to do another question. Um, well, why don't we let, we're about 10 minutes to one. Why don't we let you finish up and then we'll open it up to questions. Sounds good. Yeah, and I can run through this part more quickly. So the main tenets of rain garden ma maintenance are weed control, pruning and thinning, um, removing sediment and debris, um, replanting, and watering. Uh, and so, you know, weed control, I'll do this more quickly, but um, the basis of it is that you want to uh, focus on it in the first few years to tip the balance towards native plants. Ideally, you weed really thoroughly in May um, before the weeds get really go going and it gives the native plants a chance to take over. Um, and especially right when you install the garden and mulching really helps with that as well. Uh, make sure your leaves or that you, that you, uh, dispose of your weeds properly. Um, don't leave them open in a pile in the yard, for example, um, and check your clothes so that you're not spreading them around to other gardens. Um, you wanna make sure that you consider the, re the root type when you're weeding and that it's easier to get most of these roots after a good rain. You wanna to try to get the whole root. Um, you know, and there's a variety of ways to get rid of weeds. Um, we don't recommend using herbicides, especially around native plants. And uh, you know they can affect the the bugs that might be overwintering there as well, or or in there that you don't see. Um, but some people will use that on a larger scale. Um, and then mulching and hand cultivation are are really helpful. And I put a resource there for identifying weeds. Um, pruning and thinning, I typically recommend that people you know look at what's thriving and what's not, and you can transplant things. Um, as needed to try to fill in your garden because ideally your whole garden is full like the one you see there on the right um, that helps maintain or maximize stormwater retention. And then, you know, we could have a whole talk on, on pruning and maintaining trees and shrubs, um, but you want to do that, you know, for your aesthetic and for benefit to wildlife as well. Um, and then in terms uh, for removing dead plant material, I recommend doing it after the following spring or summer because, um, you know, you want to leave as much dead plant material on the garden as possible over the winter because that's actually you know holding a lot of seeds and plant material for wildlife um, and our winter birds especially um, and they need that cover you know the lawn doesn't provide that cover so where do they find it well they find it in your gardens um, you'll see a lot of your songbirds over the winter kind of hanging out in your evergreen bushes things like that while well, they're hanging out in your rain garden if you leave that plant material behind as well as well as the eggs all of our in overwintering insects are are found you know on that dead plant material so if you remove it and throw it out while well, you're killing all those bugs for next year and they're less likely to to complete their life cycle in your garden so that's a really important feature um, and then you know take take note of where plants didn't make it each year and fill in with new purchases or transplants from other parts of the garden and then one last note on watering um, you know if you're just planting something in there, even if it's a native plant that's supposed to, you know, handle this climate really well, uh, I would still want water it every every week, right when you plant it, especially to help those roots get really well established. Um, water older plants and well-established plants in dry spells, especially if it's a wetland plant, like I talked about earlier. Um, you want to make sure to um, to water those really well uh, and keep them wet and keep that soil moist. Um, watering never hurts if the drainage is good. Um, and one great way to do that is to consider a rain barrel, as opposed to having your gutter go right to the rain garden, we'll hook it up to a rain barrel and then let that rain barrel slowly flow throughout the garden um, as the year goes on. And if it fills up, you can have this side, uh, this, this side drainage that goes to the rain garden as well. So that, you know, if you have too much rain that the rain barrel can't capture at all, well, then you're still using your rain garden. Um, we could, you know, answer more questions about rain barrels as well. And the more that you increase the organic matter in the soil by adding compost, that helps the garden absorb and maintain moisture. And, and, and that mulching does that as well, like Ed described. And then the sediment, you wanna remove sediment, especially if you have a curb cut rain garden, uh, which most people wouldn't, but um, 
that's one kind of rain garden where you get a lot of sediment from the road, which is great. It means the garden's doing its job, but as that fills in, it reduces the capacity of the garden to handle pollutants and sediments. Same with organic material like these leaves. Um, so, you know, there's ways to, to make that easier, like installing a sediment trap. Uh, but you want to make sure to keep your rain garden at its fullest capacity by, you know, maybe every year removing sediment and debris that's accumulated right where the drain comes into it. Um, and I'll skip past this for now, but uh, just the, um, know that um, we offer uh, soil testing and technical assistance. I'd be happy to talk with anyone as a follow-up. My phone number will be listed at the end. Um, and, you know, we can do workshops and webinars on, on any of these topics as well. But I'm, I'm available to come out to people's properties and help them plan for rain gardens, do soil tests for their regular gardens, um, and generally provide technical assistance. So now we have time for question and answer. Um, and I appreciate your attention. Sure. Joe, thank you so much, Ed. Thank you so much. I, I had some misconceptions about rain gardens and that they were kind of more like a wetland. So it's really helpful to have you explain all this. Um, I do have a couple questions that are in the chat that I'd like to ask. And then anyone else who wants to ask questions um, after that, please unmute or um, type it in the chat box. Um, one of the questions is where is there a good place and what type of rain barrel is for someone looking to buy a rain barrel? Do you have any ideas on those guys? A place to get one? I don't know, Ed, do you, do you know of, of that? I know that I've looked around and I've seen them at online or you can order them through Home Depot, ones like this one. I've also made them myself and you could get yeah. barrels from yeah. maybe Polar or other <laughs> beverage companies, things like that. The first thing I the first thing I would suggest is just checking with the town because a lot of towns um, were offering rain barrels, so that would be the first step, and see if the town may already be offering rain barrels, um, and then the second one might maybe to go down and get one. I think at one of the home improvement places. Um, you all from your compost uh, webinar, I purchased my, my rain barrel through, um, I did call uh, Ed, I called the, um, the different towns and I finally found some in Athol and I know they still, the town of Athol still has them and they sell yeah. them really inexpensively and they're great. The town of Lunenburg had them. I know they, they uh, were keeping them up so they were offering them all the time. I don't know if they still have them this year, but they, they've had them in the past. Thank you. And the idea with rain barrels is the same thing as a rain garden. You're trying to capture that stormwater and slow it down. So, you know, if you don't have a large area, a rain barrel may be, do, may be all that you need to capture the stormwater from your area. And then you can use that on your lawn. You can use it elsewhere. You know, if you have a rain barrel on every gutter and you use that water throughout the week after the rain, well, you, you know, that may be all the stormwater capture you need. So they're a really great resource as well. I think that's a particularly good looking rain barrel drill. Yeah, I like that it's got the overflow very, very here. Very simple, very, yeah, it's good looking. It's got a spigot here. Maybe that's yep. connected to him watering or you can set that towards your rain garden if you wanna just leave it open. Yeah, yeah, works great. Um, I have another question. Um, the question is, should we wait until our soil is tested before starting this? So I'm assuming starting a rain garden. And how else will we know the soil is good for a rain garden? That's a great question. I, should I go forward on that one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it is important to try to see whether or not your garden is going to drain well or that area drains well. Uh, you don't want a rain garden where your soil doesn't drain. Or if you do that, you might need to consider having a drain underneath it, for example. Um, but, you know, I, I'm happy to come out and do a soil test uh, and do a little bit of an assessment for you for a fee um, to try to determine what area might be best, or you can do it yourself. There's actually a thing called a percolation test. Um, you can basically dig a hole and fill it with a certain amount of water and see how long it takes for that water to drain out of that hole. Um, and if it drains within, I think it was 12 to 24 hours, um, you know, you should be uh, should be in good shape. Be in yeah. good shape That's the simplest sits. thing to do. Yeah. 
if it sits for a long time, well, then maybe you don't have well-drained soils. Luckily in Massachusetts, a lot of our soils are pretty well-drained. Um, we have yeah. a lot of sandy loams, like Paxton sandy loam, for example. Um, and that is pretty well-drained, although we don't have a really deep to the restrictive layer. So, you know, it also depends on the slope. If you do it in a low spot in your yard, you might get some more ponding. Um, so ideally, you build a berm on a slightly sloped area with relatively well-drained soils, uh, and that kind of slows the water down and captures it. Um, but, you know, the soil test itself doesn't look at composition of the soil, um, but you could do that with a texture assessment, which is more something that I could do while I was in the field, or you could look into how to do yourself. Um, so, uh, but typically there's kind of sandy loam soils around here, which is good for, relatively good for drainage. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any more questions? I see the chat has slowed down. Um, if you have questions, you can always email us at Worcester Count ugh, on our website. <laughs> I'm trying to think of my email address. There it is. It's right here. Yeah. Thank you. WCCD plant sale at Gmail. That is there and mine is there. And I think, um, I hope you saw, I sent all of you a coupon. If you want to look at some of these plants on our website, you can um, place an order and get 10% off with that webinar 10 code. Um, there are a few of these plants Joel's talked about that are sold out that I'm trying to order more of. So I'm trying to order more aster and blue vervain um and bearberry so if you don't see what you want shoot me an email and i'll let you know if i'm getting more or just check back next week um once again thank you all for joining us and thank you so much to ed and joel for all your just, expertise just just a quick question were you going to post the guide up on the uh, seedling site yeah so gardens? is i'm going to post this um, the slides from the show today and the um, the video itself, if it's not right there, it might be a link to YouTube. And then any other resources we have about this. So if you give me the guide, Ed, that'd be great. And Joel's notes about individual plants. Um, yeah, I developed a okay. spreadsheet that we're going to make available with all those details for each of the native plants. So, you know, whether it's uh, wetland or an upland plant, um, what its shade requirements are, what its benefits to wildlife are. Um, and you can also find all those details on our, uh, in the descriptions. I just consolidated them into an Excel sheet. So if you go onto our seedling sale, you'll see all those details kind of included within the descriptions for each plant as well. Yeah. But I, hopefully that Excel yeah. sheet will help you in the planning process. Or if you want to consult with me and have me come out to your, your property, I'd be happy to do that as well. Um, we have, a, I think, a $50 site visit fee um, and $40 soil testing fee um, as part of that, so. Bargain, a bargain. <laughs> and there was another question. Um, somebody had asked, you know, you said you've installed a number of these gardens already. Is there a place someone can go to see some of them in person? Yeah, it's, and it's really easy. All you need to do is Google rain gardens and you'll have endless pictures of rain gardens and what they look like. Or alternately, you can go on YouTube and you can watch, um, just go, just put in uh, for the topic rain gardens. And there's many um, uh, videos showing the construction of a rain garden. Um, and in addition, um, some of the other points that have to do with the rain garden. So uh, both of those have a lot of information on it. Very easy to to um, access. And uh, Catherine, I will say also, um, I'm working with the Regional Environmental Council to um, have sort of a workday workshop. I think it's gonna be the third Saturday in May this year in Worcester at one of the rain gardens. It's at the Youth Education Center. Um, and if people are really interested in kind of seeing hands-on and helping out installing and fixing a rain garden, there's an old rain garden there that's a little bit in disrepair that we're gonna fix up that day. Um, it'd be great to have some volunteers um, and people to come out. So um, maybe we can send around an email to the folks that joined us today to see if they are interested and post something. That's on. the best way to learn. Definitely. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And, and we're, I'm yeah. hoping to use hands that on, as an Hands on, hands on. The best way. It's fun. Um, we got another question. Um, somebody asked if trees can be planted in rain gardens. Yes. I would yeah. generally say that you want to put in smaller trees. One of the trees that I think is particularly good in a rain garden is uh, they call them shad bush or amylanker, service berry, uh, the common names for it, but something that blooms, I think, fairly early in the season. And uh, it has produces also um, a blueberry like fruit, and birds really like it. It's a small tree. It only grows about 12, 12, maybe 15 feet tall, but it's a very pretty little tree. And we are selling that one this year. So that's one that you could get through our seedling sale. I like to eat the berries myself as well. They're, they're pretty good. There's, and there's a, there's a lot of different kinds of, uh, and I think we have more of those things, winterberry and a um, I don't recall, uh, Catherine, you may remember other things that we have for sale this year, uh, but there's a lot of different bigger shrubs and as well as small trees that you can use in a rain garden. Yeah, what would you think about putting, um, I have some like a shining sumac or a staghorn sumac in one. Do you think they would take over too much or would they be good? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I would, I think it'd be fine to put that in there. Um, but it's possible that it would start to shoot up from its roots and um, yeah, it seems over it seems that they grow years, grow like fast. Years. Um, do. So and, it just depends, uh, and you also want to consider what else you've planted there, and if it's okay that in ten years it might get shaded out. You know, you want to have sh somewhat shade tolerant species if you're going to put a shrub in there, and that's one of the things we're going to do in this rain garden. The shrubs have really taken over, so we're going to cut them back and and kind of establish good habitat for some of the perennials that have been shaded out. So it just makes it a bit more complicated, but that's why it's good to use smaller shrubs like, you know, red osier dogwood and pussy willow are, are a few that we're selling that um, weren't mentioned yet. Yeah. Um, I know we've gone kind of over time, but people are still here and I have another question. <laughs> so anyone who wants to hang out, that's great. Um, we have a question about, um, how deep is the drain in the garden? I know there was a picture that had a drain. Maybe we can go back and touch on that Yeah, subject. go to that. You don't often need a drain. Oh, Ed, maybe you should speak to this one. Generally, you don't need a drain. You wanna have an overflow, although in most cases you don't need an overflow. Um, that under drain that you see there is really something more specific. It's usually used in under drain uh, when rain gardens are built in public ways and you um, are building it on a um, area that isn't particularly well drained. Uh, and then you usually have an under drain that would go to a storm system. But as I mentioned before, when I talked about it, there was, um, we built, um, well over a hundred of these and we only needed to put an under drain in once and that was because we didn't pay attention to where we were putting <laughs> where we were putting the rain garden and it was just it didn't drain but we were able to fix it with an under drain. I have one note on that as well when I was we have more clay in Michigan where I worked installing these and there was one person who had a drainage issue that they wanted to do address with a rain garden well that that's not um uh, the rain, that's not really a reason to have a rain garden. A rain garden is to try to um, redirect your drainage to one place that drains well. Uh, it's not to address drainage because that usually has to do with the underlying soil issues. So if you have an area that's consistently wet, it's probably don't because- Don't put a rain garden. Like, don't put a rain garden there. You right. could plant some perennial plants that might help process it. You know, it's gonna do better than a lawn, but it's not gonna address the issue. The drain will address but the issue. Um, well, a rain a rain garden will will clean up uh, stormwater. So, in some cases, and we built them on uh, long roads and so forth. What we wanted to do was to clean up the stormwater that went in, and the rain garden would actually take out, filter all the pollutants out of this, or ninety percent of the pollutants that were in the stormwater, and then the cleaner water would go through the under drain back into the right stormwater system. Yeah, and I guess I should caveat what I said with, you know, if you if you have an area that doesn't have the right soils, it just means you'll 
you'd probably want to excavate it more and put in more <coughs> sand and stones, like like he says here, and maybe have an under drain, and that will help um, filter out that and and increase drainage. Um, yep. But if you're trying to do a low budget one, you know, try to do it in an area that already has good make soil. Make your life drainage. make your life easier. Don't don't put it in a place that doesn't drain. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I think we all learned a lot. We got exposed to a lot of new ideas and I've certainly learned that I've got a lot of work to do in my yard now. Um, yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's always but I can tell you where to do. get some plants. <laughs> yes, and please consider um, purchasing from our sale um, it's at uh, worcestercoshservation.org, and we're happy to have you all with us. So Great. I think we can sign off now. Thank you so much. Thank you.